Today begins what is known as Holy Week or Passion Week. It is the final week of Jesus' life, and I submit to you today, there is not another week that has been more profound. There's not another week that has had more of a life-changing impact on all of humanity than the final week of Jesus' life. And that week began with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We just watched a video about how he entered into Jerusalem, not riding on a colt, not with all of the armies of, of the world around him, but he rode in humbly on a donkey and he was met with shouts of praise and cries of Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is an absolutely beautiful word. Hosanna is a cry to God for help. It means save me or save now. But here's what I love about that word, and here's what's beautiful about it. It's not a desperate cry. It's a confident cry. It's a rejoicing cry. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem a little over 2,000 years ago, you know that those crowds of people met him with hope and excitement and anticipation. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they believed that he was the son of God in the flesh. They believed that he was the conquering king. They believed that he was here to save. And they were saying, save me, save now. Today is the day. It's finally come. Our deliverance is here. That's what they believed. It was a confident cry of praise. Can I tell you this morning? They were so right. They were so right. The crowds of people, they got it 100% right. Jesus was the Messiah. He was the son of God. He was God in the flesh. Could you imagine being there? Could you imagine just being steps away from the creator of the universe, God himself in the flesh? They were so right about Jesus. But can I also tell you this morning, they were so wrong at the very same time. He had come to save. The problem was he didn't come to save in the way that they thought he would or in the way that they expected him to. Something is completely off. Something's disturbing about Palm Sunday. Something's even just a little bit uh, uh, sickening if you stop and think about it. Because those, crowd, those crowds and those shouts of praise that met Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem in just a few short days... Just a few short days later, they would be turned into cries of rage as the same people, many of the same people are crying out, crucify him, crucify him. There's a powerful lesson that we've got to learn before we go any further this morning. The lesson is this. You can be so right and so wrong about Jesus all at the same time. There are many people in our world who know who Jesus is. We celebrate Christmas. We're coming into another wonderful holiday season. You may believe that Jesus was born. You may believe that he was the son of God. You may believe that he died on a cross, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. But still, at the same time, we can, we can put what we want Jesus to be on him. Jesus is not who we say that he is. He's not who we want him to be. He is who he says he is. He is who the Bible reveals to us that he is. And this morning, there are some really powerful lessons about Jesus that we got to know, that we've got to understand, that we've got to remind ourselves about, that we've got to worship and rejoice in again. So let's just dive right in. I got a couple of them here this morning. Number one is this. Jesus is unstoppable. If you have your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 9. I know Dave had you in John chapter 14, but we're going to be mostly in, John chapter, I mean, in Luke chapter 9 this morning. And I want you to look at verse 51 of Luke 9, and it says this, and the words will be up on the screen. Follow along, because I'm going to have you help me out here in just a minute. It says in Luke 9, verse 51, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. Everybody read that last phrase with me. What's it say? He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Here in Luke chapter 9, this marks a major transition in the life and ministry of Jesus. It was the beginning of the end. You could honestly go back and you could say that Palm Sunday really truly begins here because this is the beginning of his final journey into Jerusalem. And he knew that when he got to Jerusalem that he was going to die. Up to this point, Jesus had been ministering in 
um, the region of Galilee. He had been there for a better part of two years. And his ministry in Galilee was unbelievably successful. I mean, you want to talk about some amazing things that happened in Galilee. He healed the sick and the lame and the blind and the lepers. Man, he, uh, he calmed storms. He walked on water. He raised the dead. He fed the 5,000. He taught the Sermon on the Mount. I could go on and on, but for over two and a half years, the fame of Jesus spread. People came from all over the land of Israel to hear his teachings, to see his miracles. I mean, life was good in Galilee. Humanly speaking, it made absolutely no sense for Jesus to leave the region of Galilee. If he left Galilee and went to Jerusalem, you know what was facing him? Certain death and opposition. Either the Romans were going to get him or the Jewish leaders were going to get him. In Galilee, man, he had a successful ministry. He was loved and accepted. He was not hindered by being outside of Jerusalem because people came from all over. He could have lived there. He could have raised a family there. He could have settled down there. He could have been prosperous there. He could have been blessed there. But that's not the reason that Jesus came to this earth. He was on a mission. And verse 51 says, when the time was come that he should be received up. When the time was come, guess what? His days in Galilee were completed. He accomplished exactly what God the Father wanted him to accomplish. And then it says, when the time was come that he should be received up. That word received up is a beautiful word. It means removed. It means to be taken away in an upward motion. (laughs) Just let that sink in just for a minute right there. What's that say right there? He's risen. He's alive. When the time was come that he should be received up, that he should be removed from this world, that he should be lifted up and taken out of this world in the most remarkable and outstanding way ever. Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was determined. Nothing was going to get in the way. Jesus was unstoppable. He did not come to earth to live a comfortable life. He came to this earth to accomplish the mission that was set in motion before the foundation of the world. Before God even created us, he knew that we would sin and he knew that we would need a savior. And he came for one reason and one reason only, he came to die. And here's the practical application that we all need to know and believe this morning. Here it is. I believe that Jesus is the way. I believe that Jesus is the way. We started our message this morning with Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. God, save me, save now. Do you know that that is a universal cry of the human heart? I believe one thing that all of humanity has in common is this desperation to be saved. Just think about our world today. It doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you are on. You know what everybody is looking for? Everybody is looking for a deliverer. Everybody is looking for a savior. Everybody's looking for the person that's going to come and solve all of the world's problems and set us at peace and allow us to live prosperous lives. There is a desperate cry inside the heart of all mankind for a savior. God, save me. Save now. It's the right cry. But is it? (laughs) It's the right cry, but is it? What, What do you want your salvation to look like? You know what the Jews wanted? They wanted a political savior. They wanted a conquering king. They wanted the Romans gone. Why did they want the Romans gone? So they could go back and they could go to their houses and they could have their families and they could have prosperity and they could have peace and they could have all of their dreams and all of the things that they wanted to be fulfilled. That's what they were looking for. Can I tell you this morning that we don't need a better life? We don't need our lives to be fixed. We need a savior. We need new life. We are hopeless apart from that. And the Bible clearly tells us that there is only one way. I brought a sign this morning to help me out. Everybody help me out. What's this sign say? One way. You know that verse that everybody read out loud together just a little bit ago, John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto them, I am the, I am the way. And then that verse ends and it says, no man cometh unto the Father but by him. You know what? The cross reminds us of? Do you know what the resurrection reminds us of? Do you know what the birth of Jesus reminds us of? Do you know every time you hear the name Jesus that it ought to remind you of? It ought to remind you of the fact that there is only, there's only one way. 
There's only one way. There's only one God. There's only one God who has, only has one kingdom and there's only access to that kingdom in one way and that's through the death of his son, Jesus Christ on the cross. Why was Jesus unstoppable on his mission? Why did he set, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem? Because that was the only way. It doesn't matter if you believe in God. It doesn't matter. The world will try to tell you that as long as you believe in God, as long as your good outweighs your bad, hey, listen, that when it all ends, you're gonna get to heaven. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. There's only one way to heaven and it's through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic. It doesn't matter if you go to church every day of your life. It doesn't matter if you give to the poor. There's only one way you're gonna get to God's kingdom in the end. And that's through the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed for us on the cross. Here's the problem. We're born and naturally all of us are going the wrong way. Jesus is saying, this is the way, but we're all going this way. Have you ever found yourself on the wrong way of a one-way street? Anybody do that every time you go to Walmart? Every time I go to Walmart, I go backwards just to make my wife really annoyed. No, I don't actually do it on purpose. I'm always in a hurry and I'm always trying to cut corners. So sometimes I end up going down the, the wrong way and you can only park that way. And then another car comes out and Atlanta's always so embarrassed. She's like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, I don't really know, but here I am and I'm stuck. But that's how we go through life, isn't it? Here's the reality. We believe in Jesus and we're going this way to our life and our prosperity and our dreams. And we're trying to pull Jesus along with us. Like, yeah, God, I want you to come along and I want you to bless this life. And I want you to bless my way. And all along, Jesus is saying, stop. That's why you're crying out for a savior. Your way's not working. There's a better way. There's another way. There's one way. And it's through me. It's through Jesus Christ and only him. Hey, we've got to understand this morning that there's one way to heaven. And hopefully this one way will stay right here somewhere. There's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. Are you glad that he was unstoppable on his mission to save? Not only is Jesus unstoppable, secondly, Jesus is revolutionary. Jesus is revolutionary. Look at verse 52 of Luke chapter 9. It says, and sent messengers before his face. So he's on his way to Jerusalem. They're leaving Galilee. And in order to get to Jerusalem, they have to go through Samaria. Samaria lies right in between Galilee and Jerusalem. And so it says, And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now, if you know anything about the Jews and the Samaritans, you will know this. They absolutely hated each other. There was a ton of prejudice there. The Samaritans were half Jewish and the Jewish people looked down on them and they despised them and they called them dogs. There was any type of prejudice that you could possibly imagine. It was there and it, there was hostilities between the Jews and the Samaritans. And there's many things that they disagreed on, but one of the, the biggest disagreements that they had was over the temple. The Samaritans believed that Mount Gerizim is where Moses originally intended for the children of Israel to worship God. So you know what they did? They built a temple on top of Mount Gerizim. So you can imagine the Samaritans, they're hearing all about Jesus. They're hearing all about the Messiah. They believed in Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, just like the children of Israel did. And they're, the miracles are happening in the region of Galilee. And they find out that Jesus is leaving Galilee and he's headed to Samaria. And when they discovered the fact that he was steadfastly set on going to Jerusalem and he was going to pass them up and he was going to pass up their place of worship and their temple, they wanted nothing to do with him. It says they wouldn't receive him. Now, you might not think that that's that big of a deal, but it's not like there was a Motel 6 just lying right outside of the land of Samaria. If they did not receive him, do you know what that means? The Son of God, in the flesh, Jesus, was going to have to sleep out under the stars. There was no place for him to stay that night. There was, no place, there was probably no, nobody was preparing a meal or food for them. They would not receive him. Could you imagine rejecting Jesus Christ, the Son of God? How do you think you would feel if you were one of his followers and one of his disciples? Well, look at how James and John respond. Look at verse 54. These are my kind of people right here. Look at what it says. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, 
Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? That's what I'm talking about right there. I mean, James and John, they had it right. Jesus was revolutionary, right? He had come to save and to deliver the world. He had come to make all the wrongs right. He had come to provide justice and hope and peace. And if people were going to reject him, they needed to get what was coming to him. So James and John are like, let's call fire down out of heaven and torch these people. Do you all ever feel like that? You all ever turn on the news and say, let's call fire down out of heaven and torch these people? I hope not. You shouldn't. You're a child of God, okay? <laughs> Listen, if we're, if we're being honest, that's a very human response. That's what they thought Jesus was going to do. That's what they thought they were joining the revolution, man. They thought they were going to be a part of turning the world upside down. That's why they're all arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're all vying for position and power. But can I tell you that Jesus is so revolutionary? Look what he says in verses 55 and 56. But he turned. What's it say next? It says, but he turned and... How would you like to get rebuked by Jesus? He turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Wow. What a lesson. What a gut punch, too, again, to the people who had it so right about Jesus, but so wrong at the same time. What? What are you doing, Jesus? What is taking? Jesus wants to get the truth out that I've not come to destroy. I've come to save. And here's the practical application that we all need to get a hold of. I believe that Jesus is the truth. He's not only the way, but he is the truth. I believe our world is on a desperate search for truth. I, I believe that. I, this world, you'll find people asking questions. Does truth even exist? And if truth does exist, can it ever be found? Man, there's almost a cynicism. Maybe it's not even desperation anymore. Maybe it's just a a cynicism of the truth. If there is truth, I don't know if we'll ever know it. And so people are just left to figure it out on their own. And it seems, it seems like to me that it is harder than ever to know truth. And I believe that the reason there is such a desperation surrounding truth is because the most fundamental fact about truth is being ignored. And that is this, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. He's the higher truth. He's the deeper truth. He's the personal truth. Jesus is the one who gives meaning and value to all other truths. And we're going to constantly be searching and we're going to constantly be looking until we wrap our minds around the fact that he is the truth and what's revealed about him. You know what the truth is that we've got to know and understand? I believe with all my heart that we are created by God. We did not happen by chance. We did not happen by accident. We were created in the image and likeness of God. I believe that God created us in the garden in a perfect environment where we could enjoy unfiltered, unadulterated fellowship with him. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. But guess what happened in the garden? Adam and Eve sinned. And the Bible teaches clearly that the punishment for sin is death. And because they sinned, we all have sinned. And before you cast stones at Adam and Eve, we probably, not probably, we would have done the same exact thing. We are sinners. We're born going the wrong way on a one-way path to heaven. And the Bible tells us that because of our sin, we deserve death. And I believe that the Bible teaches that death is eternal separation from God in a very real, literal place called hell. I believe with all my heart that heaven and hell are real. Jesus himself taught more about hell than any other person in the entire Bible. He himself mentioned it over and over again. Why do you think he risked his life? Why do you think he went to a cross? Because there's a very real punishment for death. And we all deserve it. The Bible tells us for we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you know what? If I was God in my human understanding of this world and our rebellion and our sin and our brokenness, you know what I would have done? I probably would have torched this world. But that's not what Jesus did because he's revolutionary. He didn't come to destroy. He came to save. And the truth about Jesus that we need to know and understand is although we deserve death and although we deserve hell and although we deserve eternity, eternal punishment for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish 
but have everlasting life. I believe Jesus is the truth. Man, if you were lost, you know what would be really good to have? One of these little survival kits. This is just a little one. It would really be better to have a bigger one than this. But I was looking in this thing earlier today. There's some really cool stuff in here. There's a flashlight in here for the dark. You need to be able to see. There's a cool knife in here that can cut things. Cut things. Cuts things. There's one of these paracord bracelets. These things are really cool. This has got a whistle on it. You can cry out for help. It's got a flint so you can start a fire. There's another, another like multi-purpose tool in there that's like this tiny little thing that can fit in your pocket. It's got like a saw on it. My favorite thing out of everything, though, is this cool. F- Look at this, man. This is a spoon, a fork, a knife, a saw, a can opener, all in one thing. You want to talk about a multi-purpose tool? Man, that thing is awesome right there. I think I might just take that home and just start using that for everything that I do now. Probably not going to be allowed to do that. (laughs) But if you were lost, you know what you would want? You would want a survival kit. You would want some sort of a survival package. You understand that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Can I tell you that Jesus is everything that you need? The Bible tells us that he is the light of this world. He wants to be a light unto your path. You ever feel like you're wandering around in darkness? You ever feel like you're you're bound and chained, you're just stuck in your brokenness and your sin and your obstacles feel like they're just too overwhelming to overcome? He came to set you free. He wants to cut you free from the bondage and the chains and the power of sin. Can I tell you that he's the bread of life and it doesn't matter if you need strength, if you need peace, if you need healing, if you need help. It doesn't matter what your need is today. He is the bread of life. He's what you need to meet whatever the need is for you. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to save. He came on a search and rescue mission to find you where you're at, to provide you with everything that you need. And can I tell you that know Jesus as your savior, those of us that are Christians, We are not mercenaries that need to go into this world with an attitude of torching everybody that doesn't believe in Jesus. We are are Red Cross workers. We are search and rescue people. That's why we are here. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. There is a world that is broken and lost and hurting in desperate need of Jesus. And it's our job to take them the truth of who he is. And last but not least, Jesus is Lord Jesus must be Lord. What James and John, what all the other disciples of Jesus had to learn was that his journey is our journey. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, go ahead and put them up on the screen. He already told them this earlier before he even got to this point. But he said, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And then everybody read out loud verse 24. It says this. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. You know that one-way path that we're on? You know what we're trying to do this whole time? We're trying to save our life. And if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. You know what Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to lose our life. He wants us to die to ourselves. When he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, you know what he wants us to do? He wants us to steadfastly set our face to follow him. He wants us to come to a point of repentance where we recognize that our way is leading us nowhere and we turn and we believe in him. And even as believers, he wants us to get on our knees and to die to ourselves and to take up our cross and say, okay, God, fine, I'm done with this and you are Lord of my life. And I believe that Jesus is the life. He's not just the way, he's not just the truth, but he is the life. And there needs to be a turning point where we say, I'm done with pursuing what I want. You have all of me. You are the life. You are everything that I'm looking for and everything that I'm searching for. Problem is, that is incredibly hard. To die to yourself, to die to all the things of this world. I brought one more illustration with me this morning. I've been dying to use this ever since I saw it in the Conqueror series. It is so good. Imagine being outside on a hot day. Maybe it's just a cool spring day like it has been. How many of you have been doing yard work lately? getting your house all cleaned up, your yard all ready to go. All right, imagine being out there. You've worked hard. You turn around and you finally look up. Man, all those leaves are raked. The grass is freshly mowed. There's that little bit of nice smell in there. The sun is out. And man, 
there's a satisfying feeling, but you know what you are? You're thirsty and you're hungry and you go inside and imagine going inside and there are these fresh picked, ripe strawberries just sitting right there in front of you, man. These just got delivered to our house. Someone, Miss Sandy dropped these off yesterday, freshly picked right out of a field and they were sitting there so red and so ripe. And then you just take about, how many of you like want a strawberry even right now, man? It's just sounding good. All right, so, man, you, you know, you can taste it, right? You can taste it, man. This is pretty good. Maybe you don't like strawberries. Just think of your favorite fruit or whatever it is, okay? The point is this, man, you can taste it. It tastes so good. But now imagine going in the house and sitting right next to that strawberry is this guy right here, a Snickers bar. The reality is you aren't you if you're hungry, okay? That's their slogan right there. You're like one of those mean people. So now, now imagine that you go in and there's these fresh-picked strawberries, but there's also this Snickers bar sitting right next to you. How many of you are going straight for this guy right here, the Snickers? How many of you are going for the strawberries? How many of you, it just depends on the day and the moment and how you're feeling, okay? That's where I'm at probably. The older I get, the more I choose the strawberries. There's some wisdom that's coming in. But here's the reality. Now imagine this, they're both sitting here, okay? You come in and you take a bite of this strawberry, when your mouth is watering, you're thirsty, all that stuff's going on, this thing is going to taste so sweet and so refreshing. Now imagine if you eat the Snickers bar first, and then you go and grab the strawberry. It might not even taste good. That same exact strawberry that might have been so satisfying and so fulfilling, it might now taste a little bit bitter. It's not going to taste that sweet. Something's just going to be a little bit off about it. You know what these are? These are the real thing. This is fruit. This is good for you. This is made from God. You know what it says on the back of here, these um, ingredients? There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And then it says at the very bottom, artificial flavor. This is artificial. If you have a steady diet of these, along with some other good food, it's going to be really good for you. If you have a steady diet of this, you're going to need another diet. You're going to have to choose only strawberries and you're going to have to go through a really tough, painful time trying to get rid of it. Do you all understand what I'm trying to say? The reason why it is so hard for us to choose Jesus and the reason why it's so hard for us to surrender to the fact that he is the way, he is the truth, and ultimately he is the life is because we've been tainted by the artificial flavors of this world where it makes Jesus look less appealing and less satisfying. And that's why we want the best of both worlds. But Jesus is trying to get us to open up our eyes and to understand, take up your cross and follow him. There's no comparison. Yeah, this might taste good. This might look good, just like everything that you've been pursuing in life, but it's not the real thing Jesus is. And all this is going to leave you with is regrets. And all this is going to leave you with is the desire that you need something to save you and you need something to save you now. And when you give your life to Jesus, wow, you really find out that he truly is every single thing that you need. When Jesus asks us to die to ourselves and take up our cross and follow him, all he's asking us to do is to die to the things that will never satisfy and fulfill and be alive to him. When he asks you to take up your cross and follow him, you know what he's asking you to do? He's asking you to trust him. To trust the God of heaven, the King of kings and Lord of lords who loved you enough to become a man, to humble himself, to steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And before he even stepped foot into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, a little over 2,000 years ago, he wept and he cried because he knew that the crowds would turn and he knew that the cross was waiting for him and he knew that his father would turn his back on him when he became sin for us who knew no sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is the way. He is the truth, and he is the life. And the best decision you can ever make is to surrender your all 